and offered a security and Leibniz trade-off that we didn't have before. As you get past that and you get into Ava Labs, okay, what does Ava Labs do? Well, Ava Labs has this brilliant group of engineers that are supporting Avalanche Go and the node architecture, the consensus in the networking layer. But then there's the stack between that and everything that's at the application layer. And they're providing those tools in between with the goal of allowing builders to get their ideas to market as quickly as possible, as cost effectively as possible. And so when you think about Ava Labs, you know, it's kind of turning into this kind of AWS for Web3 where we are trying to push out these vehicles for builders to take their ideas and make them a reality as quickly as possible. So what do you do? What's the value proposition? Um, so if you use Avalanche, you know it's super fast, transaction fees are low, um, and it has subnets which give you this unlimited scaling opportunity build your blockchain on your terms. Um, Ava Labs, as I talked about, is providing these infrastructure services, these development services. Um, it's gonna keep pushing out ways for you to, say, uh, accept credit cards in your application without having to build that fundamental stack. And these are the kinds of things, and you're starting to see it with, hey, launch your own subnet. Hey, you know, write your own VM. Um, hey, you need a wallet that represents your native token? We got you. Do you need an explorer? Absolutely, so all that stuff comes with the package. And so again, you're just focusing on your business idea. Okay, so it's kind of your standard flywheel. It, it, it focuses on the user. Uh, so it's just, you know, what do users want? What problem are we solving? And then let's design and build an application. Let's deploy it and hype it. And let's acquire users if we have the right fit, monetize, expand the functionality. So build the wedge, go from there, all right? This is kind of where we started. And it was quickly evident from a product point of view that this is not the model for us. And this is kind of one of the points that I want to say is that every product journey has its own fingerprint, right? It's specific to your culture, your leadership. Ours looks more like this, which is facilitate the easy deployment of Web3 applications, right? Make it easy for you to take your idea and see if there's a product market fit. That'll lead to Increased deployments, right? We want applications launching that are solving real world problems across multiple channels. That's the real world problem. That will get you to your user count. And this is where usually step one is, is how do we acquire the users? This is actually step four because it starts with the builders and the builders bring the users. That'll create new demand. Oh, this is really cool, but can it do this? And that's your flywheel for Web3. And this is where we are really thinking, which starts here for us, which is just how do we facilitate builder deployments on Avalanche and on subnets. Okay, and then we create some, some lofty guiding principles that are very hard to achieve. Uh, we strive to meet these, it takes time, but there's two tenants in product that we have. One is, it's gotta be easier to build and easier to use on web two. Now we all know that this is not necessarily the case right now, but everything we do has this in mind. Two, it has to offer value that, that Web2 cannot, right? Decentralization, privacy, ownership of your own data, whatever the case may be, and ideally both. And if you can get both of them, then you're onto something. Okay, and then we, 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 there's a culture, right? Our culture has always been the same. This, this comes from this top down. It starts with good, which is like deliver things. Right? Deliver us something. Don't, I don't want something that takes six months and you think it's going to be perfect and you're grinding, 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 and then you get it and there's no TAM, right? Or you're just completely off. It's deliver 10 iterations of that and then see if the market likes it and then pivot and tweak and go from there. So, you know, Ava Labs has always been a culture of delivery first, which is why we don't have this future lofty roadmap that says, oh, we're going to do this and this and this and this, because we know we're going to make changes as we deploy, as we change, as we learn. So we basically have a roadmap of delivery, which says, hey, these are all the things we've done, judge us on our past, and then we're gonna show you what we can do in the future. Okay, and then some simple mental models. So I'm a big proponent of simplicity in product. Like it's gotta be easy and everybody's gotta be able to remember it, and it should just be kind of like a knee-jerk reaction. So I use this one, it's really oversimplified, but like first thing I ask myself is what we're building, does it have utility? 
Will people want to use it? Is it solving a problem that people have today? Or are we trying to shove a technology that's really cool into something that really doesn't need it yet? Is it easy to use, right? So second one. Um, this one's a little bit harder to answer, but people will use things that have tremendous utility, even if they're hard to use. I think we've seen this cycle now, and I'll show an example of that. And then the last one, which is pretty subjective, but is it pretty? Does it work? Is it a pleasure to use, right? We're starting to see more of this um, and less bouncing around and more integrated experiences. Uh, you know, and this one's probably the hardest, but I love this because this embodies to me everything that is like getting us. To, this has tremendous utility. Like the application utility is undoubtable. But you have these things like try crypt two and then crypto v2 and then you have all these codes underneath that. There's another one here that cracked me up. Uh, Anyways, factory, yeah, all of it, all of it. It's just, it's kind of gorgeous in its own way. And this team is like extremely capable and this is totally intentional. This wasn't meant for everybody. This was meant for the people who wanted to get in early and participate. But it's not gonna get us to mass adoption. Okay, so that's just kind of like where we start. These are the core tenets of which over the time, you know, working with the teams and working with the engineers kind of what we built into like our culture and our mainstay. Now we get into this, this product evolution cycle, which was a very interesting cycle for me. It's the first one of these kinds. I've been in and I've been doing this for a long time. So we start here, right? Uh, avalanche consensus model, super novel, um, something that is different from anything else out there. It creates a natural differentiator, but it's a technology, right? So you gotta find an application for that technology. At this point, when we joined, we went to mainnet, that's what we had. We had beautiful technology. We had a beautiful group of technologists who were doing things that people hadn't done in the past, making things that did exist better, but there was no UI for it, right? This is just all deep, deep tech. And so it's like, okay, what do we need to do now and what's the next level? And that's when we build the second stack of our product pyramid, right? And so this is core properties and I'll get into what all these mean. But this is essentially like, how do we leverage all this great technology that these wonder, wonderful engineers are building so that the common person can, uh, can pull utility from the application? Okay, so this is kind of where we are now, which is, and this is really built around subnets and all the technologies that surround it. But how do we take all this technology and make it so that, hi, so you can deploy it for your needs, right? It's not, oh, I have an application, I'm gonna drop it onto this monolithic chain that's gonna suit all my needs. It's, I have this business and I wanna wrap this technology around it in a way that makes sense for me. And we'll talk about some examples of that as well. And then finally, we get into partnerships and integrations. And this is kind of the top of the pyramid, which is, all right, we have all these great solutions that you can use to get your idea to market quickly, but every single channel has different needs. Um, you know, gaming wants um, the use of credit cards, on-chain verifiable randomness. They want SDK integrations like Unity Unreal. That's a very channel-specific uh, application. And then government, they don't want any of the crypto, right? But they want the distributed ledger technology because it creates efficiencies and it takes disparate data sources and it puts them all together and something that creates, um, it, it, it creates a, a picture everybody can understand from something that's a bit of a spaghetti right now. I mean, the government use case is, is, is brilliant in a lot of ways, and we'll go into that as well. But it's not one that everybody thinks of, right? So that's when we get into this top of the pyramid, which is like, we need these specific solutions to meet specific channel needs. Okay, so now we're getting into the product stack, right? So we have these product areas. Those are the four I just went through. Um, and this is our product stack. So at the, at the deep tech, and this is where like Patrick and Steven and Aaron, they spend all their time as the platform technology. So that's the consensus layer, that's the networking layer, that's the three chains, um, and that's subnets. And then there's also an R&D channel of you know, very smart people like Ted Yen, who are just coming up with you know, better database models, uh, you know, faster VM models. And working on those in the background to keep driving the innovation at this core level. So then core properties. 
So core properties, again, is everything that we use to leverage the stack, to, to take that deep technology and pull as much value out of it as possible. It typically comes in the form of our wallet. So you have core, the browser extension, um, the web version, which is complementary but doing a lot of different things, interoperability. So there's a lot of versions of interoperability. Our first version of this was the Avalanche Bridge. It's a secure enclave-based bridge that allows you to transfer assets from um, Ethereum to Avalanche and also from Bitcoin to Avalanche. Uh, and then we're starting to get into, okay, so these subnets, they need to interoperate. They need to interoperate at a VM layer. They need to interoperate at the subnet layer, subnet, and they need to interoperate from subnet or mainnet back to other net, right? And so we have to solve for these solutions so that at the end of the day, you shouldn't really have to know that you're using a Web3 application in order for Web3 to really make sense to a broader audience. Um, and then finally, explorers. So just a, you know, some way to see what has happened on-chain historically. There's many versions of this. R supports all the chains we have, and then it has to support all the subnets too. You cannot, in most cases, launch a viable subnet and not have an explorer. And, and that sounds like a simple thing, but actually having, a, having an explorer that supports your subnet at the time you launch um, that is easily maintainable is a really big undertaking. Uh, there's entire businesses around that. Oops. How far did I go? Two. No, we got to go all the way. Okay, we're good. Perfect. Okay, so managed services. So we've built all these services now, right? We have all these technologies um, that have been skillfully built, and now we need to make them all work together and align. This is really a bigger challenge because you have these teams that are focusing on this one idea, um, these very complex ideas, and now you need to have a way for them all to work together in this really nice orchestration. Yeah. So that's what this managed services is about, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, and this is where we are today. But this is where you take you know, your custom VM and teleporters are interoperability, and you need a faucet for your test net, and you need your explorer. Oh, and you want a pre-compile library because there's some things you want to use there. Um, you need data ingestion and, and quick retrieval of data, which is our Glacier APIs. You need an operations console so you can see how your subnet's performing. There's all these components around the Web3 application. We want to take them, make them very easy for you to use. So it's just, you don't have to think about these, you're thinking about the underlying business application there. Okay, and the, and the final one we talked about this. So this is, these are the five channels where we're kind of focused right now. This is where we see a lot of the activity. Um, so DeFi is more, con and this is the one that I kind of set off the last bull market. Enterprise, gaming, government, institutional. A lot of the NFT stuff falls in gaming. There's a whole culture aspect there um, that we use. But these are the five channels where we think there's going to be custom solutions down the road. Okay. Um, any questions? I'm going to just take a breather there. Does anybody have any questions on what we covered? So all this stuff has been a progression over time. It wasn't clear to us that the top, the fourth layer of that pyramid was going to exist from the very beginning. You know, we started off with like this deep technology, a group of really smart people, and then said, okay, what's the next necessary step? What are people asking for? What's the next, next necessary step? And we worked our way up. So it really has been an evolution. Yeah, sure. What's that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so enterprises is just more of your traditional Web2 businesses. So um, like Adidas wants to, say, launch NFTs that associate with your shoes, buy the shoe, get an NFT or limited releases. As they come in and they want to integrate Web3 into their Web2 experience, get this kind of Web2.5 thing happening, we need to have a channel that's specific to addressing, say, login with email with have a wallet associated with that email, right? And these are the kinds of solutions that we're trying to work out there. Okay, so this has definitely evolved and it looks like a giant stack, but this is everything that the product group entails. These are all the eight pillars of responsibility uh, that we take on. So, you know, product management, it's your classic vision, roadmap, prioritization, where do we go in, what does the market want, and then, uh, evangelizing that out and enabling the rest of the company to build that application so that it's meeting those needs. 
product design is really just that. If it has a UI, what does it look like? And as we build more and more products, how do we keep them aligned in the way they flow and the components we're using just so that it's a very clean user experience? Uh, project management is just execution, right? So as the company gets bigger, we need more people who are, hey, this is the steps we take. This is the way we work. This is the way we test everything. I mean, those people are there just making sure that the execution and the quality of delivery is always the same and consistent across all these various products that you saw, which leads us to product quality, which is just a team of test engineers whose only role is to make sure that the application is meeting the standards by which we expect it uh, to be delivered with. Product market strategy, so product marketing. So we, we want people embedded into the product team who have their ear, ear to the ground on the product. We want them to understand every detail of what's going on. And a lot of it as you go in that stack, especially at the platform level, that stuff's complex. Like I've been two years around it and there's a level at which my head just kind of stops and I, I get it, but we need people to be able to take all the cool things that these engineers are doing and be able to and explain them in a way that everybody can understand it, right? So that the constant cycle of innovation that's happening at Avalanche and Avalabs is being voiced out in a consistent brand, uh, creating a consistent identity. Product analytics, which kind of goes up here. We had this idea, we think it's gonna do this, and then we launch and learn, and it's like, how do we do? Did we hit the mark? Did we miss the mark? Um, so that team is there to answer those questions, and they're embedding their analytics kind of into the product, uh, which is a tricky one too, because you know, the Web3 ethos is we're not going to track the user. We're not going to know who you are. We really want to give you your space. But an aggregated point of view, we want to know like, hey, do you like this thing? Is it working? It's very hard to understand who's at the other end of your Web3 product right now. Product support. So if we launch it, this is a great feedback loop, which is why it didn't end up in the product group. But um, as people are feeding back, right, a lot of it's just maybe we didn't design something right. Maybe something's not intuitive but it goes from the product support team and then it works its way back as a feedback loop back into the product team. So if there's enough signal in what we're hearing, it comes in as a feature and we make sure we address it effectively. And then lastly, the product implementation team. And this really goes back into that top stack, the fourth pillar, which is just, if you commit to building on Avalanche, we wanna make sure that you go from your idea to market as quickly as possible without us being in the way at all. We want to facilitate everything you need to be able to get you to market so you're like, yeah, I know how to use this. I had questions on the protocol or I had questions on how to implement this. I had questions on how to use pre-compiles and you didn't get stuck there, right? You had a team that was supporting you and making sure you had your questions answered so it was easy for you to focus on the application and not the meta around it. So that's the product, that's the eight pillars of our product group um, and each of them serves a very important purpose. We started with just one. You know, when I started, there was, there was one product manager, um, and now we're about 26. So we've really built this out in each of these disciplines. As you know, the demands of the community have gotten bigger, we've built teams to serve those demands. Any questions on this? Yeah, please. Any, any of those chunks like, are the, that you found as difficult? Yeah. <laughs> I think all of them have their own uh, stress points. So, you know, the ESO, ethos on analytics has been big internally on just like, what do we capture, what do we don't capture? And you have people that are more traditional who want information on, it's, it's yeah, very hard to do your job as a product person if you don't have any feedback loops, right? You're just like, what are people doing with it? But at the same point, you don't wanna go back to a Web2 model where you're just like data mining everybody, right? That's just, we're never gonna do that. That's just not why we're here at all. Um, you know, I think product support is just, it's also tough because you have a lot of people that are maybe kind of getting used to the paradigm shift of web two versus web three, but at the same time, that's a good feedback loop to say, hey, we're not quite there yet on a mass adoption because it's still not easy. These rails are still confusing people. Mnemonics will always be something as a point of confusion for the bulk of people. And I think there's a lot of people trying to solve that. But anyways, all these have, you know, I think their, their own challenges, um, but I would say those two, those two are big ones. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think it's on. The, I th so? 
Okay. What are the metrics used to measure the product uh, quality? Yeah, I mean, it can be anything depending on what the product is. They're all very product specific, but most of them are like, uh, you know, where are people downloading the browser extension from? Like, how many downloads do we get today? Um, you know, what functionality when we launch it, does it move the needle? Does it not move the needle? Um, and so it's basically like a, a historical adoption because adoption is kind of where we're at. And so a lot of it's just around like, are we connecting with this very hard to see user? And with this user that's really, you know, the user endpoint is constantly evolving and changing as this industry is young, just like the technology is evolving and changing. So we don't say, you know, it's not like Nike where we can say, oh, this is our user A, yeah, this is our user B, and that's going to be consistent for a long time. It just doesn't work like that right now. It's just constantly changing. So that's a lot of what the metrics are, is that we have to say, okay, let's launch this, and are people using it? No. Okay, we missed. Why did we miss, and what do people really want? And that's a lot of what the analytics team is doing. Okay, so where are we going? So this has been our top line strategy since January, right? Then when in um, January one, we said, okay, we're gonna do three things. And if we accomplish these three things this year, we're gonna be in a good place. One was built for scale. And this is just a, a huge testament to our platform team um, with the launch of subnets, custom VMs, pre-compiles, everything they've done at that layer has been incredible. And that really allows for infinite scale. Theoretically, you can just keep launching and scaling horizontally to meet your demands. So make it accessible to everybody. Uh, and that's what core is, right? Core is, is the initial endeavor to make Web3 very accessible to everyone. And you know, we're starting, we started with core, which is, has its user interface and it's, it's a product. But you know, we'll move into kind of a wallets as a service model where you don't have to use core if you don't want to. If you want to use services or you need wallet services for your specific business, you can white label those. You can hit these endpoints. You can leverage those services for your needs. Right? Yeah, we're, again, we're not trying to build at the application layer. We're not trying to say, use our applications. We're just trying to say, hey, we've got all this technology here for you. Um, and we've got you know, a very fast chain. And if you put all these components around, hopefully you can get your idea to market more quickly on Avalanche, and you'll start to see the benefits of that. And that'll you know, feed that flywheel that we talked about. And then eliminate the builder friction. So this goes into that last point when you see that circle and I'll get into it. But that's, that's subnets as a managed service, blockchains as a service, build your own blockchain. Here's all these components that you can use to get to market quickly. Here's the SDKs, here's you know, your Avapay, credit card, ACH capabilities mixed in with crypto all in one. Okay, so where are we going? So there's a huge focus on subnets and custom VMs, right? We get the question pretty regularly, like, how fast can you make one of these go, these subnets, right? And the answer is extremely fast. We have a team of people who are, who are really pushing the limits on what's possible um, within an EVM, you know, just by tinkering with certain parts of it. And that's the beauty of it. It's your implementation. It's what you need it to do. Um, and so you can control your gas. You can control a lot of the parameters. Now, there's safety considerations in all of those things, and so you, you have to have consulting, but that's what the product support team and the implementations team there is to do, is to say, hey, that's probably not going to be very safe. You're going to be opening yourself up to DOS if you go through those things. But that's where a lot of the focus is. It's just on allowing people to spin up blockchains that serve their business needs quickly and effectively and in a, um, a cost-effective manner. Interoperability. So we know all these things need to talk to each other. And so um, this is a big priority for us right now. Subnet to subnet communication is available right now. And there's an entire team that's heads down on solving for this and they're starting to see the initial um, designs come out as part of the pl platform. The very cool thing about what's happening here is that the core of this is being built into the protocol. So it's not going to be a layer that sits on top. It's not going to be an application. Uh, it'll live within Avalanche, the Avalanche GoNet. Stateful pre-compiles. So I, you know, Aaron, Aaron Buckwald's talked a lot about these, and he's really championed this effort. Um, but it's basically just you know, write smart contract logic, take it down into a pre-compiled state, write in any language you want. It's more performant. It's more gas efficient. Um, and so you can take a lot of what would normally live inside a smart contract 
and you can put it in state, um, stateful precompiles. So when we talk about like, I always keep this little thing up here, because again, there's this four point stack, we're at that deep tech stack, and that's really what's happening here. Yeah, please. Is there a general rule of thumb of when it makes sense to spin up your own subnet? It's a really good question, because it doesn't always make sense. There's quite a bit uh, more overhead associated with it. But I think it, there's a couple points at which um, you've started to prove that you have product market fit, and that the total amount of volume that you're um, pr transaction processing has gotten to the point where you want your own subnet. Uh, you have a um, a tokenomic structure where you want your own gas token for some reason. And then third, there's like, you know, the weird government use case where they're like, we love blockchain, we don't want crypto, right? And so they obviously can't launch on the, on the C chain for that. Um, so it, it really varies, but a lot of it is like, you should probably test your idea on mainnet, prove it, and then when you get some momentum, move it over to subnet. Thanks. Okay, so Dean went over a lot of this, right? And this is our whole accessibility layer. Um, so Core Mobile is close, and it'll be the trifecta of the browser extension, the web, and the mobile. Tremendous undertaking by these teams throughout the year uh, to create such amazing products. And the whole reason that we went down this road, right, because, like, does the world need another wallet? It's questionable, right? But... Uh, we can't ask people in good faith to deploy on Avalanche and build their own subnets if they don't have a wallet that supports it natively. We can't ask them to do that if they don't have an explorer that comes with it. And so we really didn't, you know, we have such a strong belief in the power of subnets that we really had no choice but to build core. Um, and it does a ton of other really cool stuff on top of it, but, you know, that's the foundation. On web, we'll be starting to get, and, and uh, actually all of them will start to have DeFi portfolio. So you'll start to see your portfolio balances include your smart contracts, um, kind of very similar to like what, what DBank has been doing. Um, NFT aggregators. So we won't launch a marketplace. Again, we're not going to play at the application stack. We want, we want you to deploy the applications, but we will aggregate this stuff and make it very easy for the user, basically provide uh, projects with another distribution point, right? for aggregation, and that, and the NFT aggregator is an example of that. It'll support X and P chain, so this is more of a technical thing, but the benefits here is that you can get validation, delegation, and staking um, through the core app. So right now there are two divisions, we're gonna clean that up and combine them. Validator center, so there's two versions of this. If you're launching a private network and you need to go out and find people who wanna validate your network, trusted partners, good uptime, Maybe, they, you, maybe there's a KYV thing where you need to know the validator. Um, there'll be a marketplace for you able to find those specific ones to suit your needs. And then on the flip side of that, um, if you launch a subnet, right, all the existing validators in Avalanche, well, you want them to validate your subnet. That'll create greater decentralization. So it's basically a place where they can go and say, hey, these are the reward structures for this subnet. Because when they add the valid, your subnet and decide to validate it, they're taking on additional resource costs on their side, right? And so we really want to make it easy kind of to hook buyer and seller together in this world. So BT, BC Bridging and, and Core Web, um, that'll be here before the end of the year. We're going to keep in, improving the Explorer for everybody. And then we talked about the expanded interoperability, which really starts with subnet to subnet, VM to VM. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you have plans to eventually have C-Chain support, or no, on, C on the mobile? I see right now it's X and P-Chain. Are you also going to No, no, the this is, so th sorry. I've just put Core Mobile, it's confusing, actually. I okay. put Core Mobile bigger because it's kind of the big launch. It's a whole product launch. That this is, is all other stuff, yeah. Got it. X, yeah, so C-Chain support is in mobile, and everything else as it launches is the first thing. It's X and P that kind of lag behind a little bit. Thank you for clarifying that. I was like, where the hell is the C-Chain? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Right? So I, I now know that, like, what my intended point of launching that was not the right point. I'll make that small again. Yeah. Okay, so this is an area I'm super excited uh, about. So it really is just how do, we, you know, we, how do we take this, and it goes back to this flywheel concept of just 
fac facilitating the entrepreneurs, like getting the builders and making it so they don't have to be like super devs in order to launch a blockchain to realize their vision. Um, and that's what a lot of this goes in. So it's streamlined provisioning, right? So get your subnet out quickly um, and easily. And, you know, we're working with various cloud providers to, you know, we, we announced our, uh, our partnership with AWS in March. We're going deeper on that partnership and really making it so there's these nice push button deployments with all the tooling you need. So customization. So, you know, what, if you're launching a subnet, what are the right tokenomics? Right. Well, we're trying to start to create some wizards that say, hey, these are some models that we've seen work. So you're not starting from a blank page. You can say, what am I trying to accomplish? Like a game might want super fast throughput, super low gas fees, and maybe not care about decentralization that much. Well, that's a very specific model for them. Right? And so we want to just say, these are some best practices we've seen in that area. So you don't have to go through all that thinking again. Fully managed operations. So... Um, Let's just say you don't want to focus on managing all of your own deployments, the upgrades, everything associated with running uh, blockchain services. Uh, Avalabs will do that for you. Um, and so we can host and create elasticity and so you can scale on demand and all the things you need to, to run an effective business but not have to think about it. And then building channel specific solutions that plug in. So like um, on-chain verifiable randomness is the best one because games need that. And so you shouldn't have to build that yourself. You launch your subnet, you kind of get into what other things do I need? I need to accept credit cards, you know, and I need verifiable randomness, and you plug those things on, on your way. So you, again, keeps you from having to build these things yourself. Um, with the whole thing of get your ideas to market faster and cheaper, right? That's kind of the mantra within this team. Okay, summary. I'm not going to go up on the last one because it really would steal like a lot of BD's thunder, but it's more about kind of working with specific partnerships um, and they're saying, hey, this is the implementation we want and then we're building those services or helping them build the services they need to be able to launch their subnets. That's that whole partnerships and integrations. It's very specific implementations for very specific business needs. So in summary, so we have this incredible technology stack that enables innovation. Right? This is the, the product starting. We were given this um, at the very beginning. This is the gift that got us started. So now we need to create all these products that enable builders and users to really leverage that technology. Remove the barriers of entry that stand between going from ideation to market delivery. And then, of course, it has to scale and have real world adoption. Like the last thing we'd want to do is for you to get your idea to market, have it explode, and then have it Crawl, yeah, exactly, implode, exactly. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the core goal and where we're going, and I see us being heavily focused on this area for the next six months to a year. That's it. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Any other questions for we? Great, I appreciate everybody that, yeah, please. Uh, so you mentioned you partnered with AWS. Uh, what, if anything, do you have in place to prevent them from doing what they did to Parler, for example? Just pulling the plug on the entire thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's no... Uh, the good answer to that is you partner with multiple providers so that you're not relying on any one. And we do that. Um, so we will spread it across. Um, they've been e very eager to get into space, and I think that they have... Um, a level of engineers who really respect the depth of this technology and how it's leading edge. And I, quite honestly, they've tried to build it themselves and it's, I think they've learned how difficult it is. Um, and so, you know, they've been more willing to kind of sit down at the table and say, how do we really collaborate to take the stack we have, combine it with the stack you have, and then create this vision of like builders getting to market more quickly. Um, so that's why there are natural choice, but it's a totally valid point, and you should be able to launch anywhere you want. You can launch, you know, on a on your own private machines, right? There's nothing to keep you from doing that. Um, this is just a simple way of doing that. But the the answer is just spread your region, spread your risk across multiple vendors. Gotcha. Sure. You mentioned uh, VR interoperability or VM interoperability be built, baked into the core protocol. 
would an upgrade like that or a major one like that ever require a hard fork of the network? So hard fork uh, is an interesting term, but it, it requires an upgrade, right? So you would need to, to upgrade your node to the latest. There are certain packages and things that are being built that if you're on a previous one, you won't be able to take advantage of that functionality. So we very much encourage you to kind of get up to latest in order to take advantage of things like interoperability. Great. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.